So, questions? Does anybody have a question? Let's see, last time, um, because of the uh, pizza, things were sort of um, irregular. I'm going to, I think, have to repeat some of that material. Um, I also found some typos in the section on group theory. All right, let me, um, in fact, what I did, uh, because I had that big black sphere and was going to do the demo, I um, skipped some material on group theory that I think is important. So I'm going to go back and do that. Um, so let me just remind you that we have um, We have elements G with some parameters, let us say alpha, in some group G. We have uh, G of, let us say, alpha 1, G of alpha 2, so is G of alpha 3. A representation, then, of the group is D of alpha 1, D of alpha 2, is D of alpha 3. These are the elements of the group, these are n by n matrices, and they respect the multiplication law of the group. So that's the idea of a representation. And we define the generators as uh, T sub A is minus I partial with respect to alpha A of D of alpha, at alpha is equal to zero. And so we're saying then that the, the D of alpha um, can be thought of as e to the i alpha a t a. Um, if the group is compact, the t a's are Hermitian and the d's are unitary. Okay. We saw that the structure quantity generators have to obey a, um, a uh, commutation relation like this where these are the structure constants and we saw that in order for different representations to respect the same multiplication law we had to have the same structure constants. The structure constants, I think last time we got so far as, we certainly got so far as to say that they were given by minus i over some constant k that depends upon the representation. The trace of TATB and then TC dagger. Here the understanding is that, um, uh, where did I have that? Yes. The trace of uh, TA dagger TB is K delta AB. And the K is a property of the representation, just as the dimension of the matrices is a property of the representation. And but the structure constants are the same for all um, representations. Okay, um, you can see from this formula that the structure constants are always anti-symmetric in the lower indices. Because if you interchange B and A, you get a minus sign, because this is a commutator. And so this is equal to minus F B A C. We also showed, I think we showed this last time or the time before, that if the um, group is compact, then uh, one can go further. Um, namely, this, if the group is compact, 
then the TAs are Hermitian. And then um, what one has is that FABC is uh, totally anti-symmetric. And you normally write it as FABC like that. So, but that's only if they're, they're compact. The group is compact. Well, it's that the parameter set is closed and bounded. Um, so for example, the rotations about a single axis is the interval 0 to 2 pi, the closed interval 0 to 2 pi, including both 0 and 2 pi. Um, on the other hand, the translations are non-compact because the parameter space is just all real three vectors. Are they, so is, are translations closed and not bounded? Is that correct? I, I guess one could say that they are closed because any convergent sequence in, of, of real three vectors converges to a real three vector. So yes, they are closed, but, but certainly not exactly. bounded. You know. um, also, the Lorentz group, the parameters there are unbounded, and you, you're, you're just whacking. Um, you, can, you can have a boost of arbitrarily high energy. And um, of course, the speed doesn't go to infinity. But uh, in contrast to classical. 19th century physics, but um, the uh, the energy required uh, does go to infinity. And in fact, um, I think they're going to be turning off for LHC in the winter because there's a shortage of hydraulic power in Switzerland. Hydraulic electric power. Now, I, don't know, I haven't been at CERN in a very long time, so I may. I may have, I may have misspoken. Yeah. So is that if only if, for if G is compact, T is Hermitian? Are there non-compact groups for which T is Hermitian? <clears throat> if the group is non-compact, then typically you have some T's that are Hermitian and some that are not. Yeah. And in particular, the Lorentz group is is is, is an example that we'll be getting to probably by the end of the hour. Um, and these structure constants are also real when the group is compact. And you can see that, I guess, over here. Um, well, let's see. It's a little more complicated than that. So let me, let me just show you F, A, B, C, complex conjugate would be I over K trace of, and now you're taking the adjoint, so this would be um, TC, and now this would be TB, TA, because the product of TA, the adjoint of TA, TB is TB, TA. And so the commutative flips. But now, um, when you, where this is C. Um, when you now, the trace is cyclic, and if you flip the TB and TA again, you get minus I over K, the trace of uh, TA, TB, TC, and this is F, A, B, C. So when the, when the group is compact, these structure constants are very nice. They're real, they're totally anti-symmetric. But in general, they're not. But they're always anti-symmetric in the two lower indices. Okay. Um, shall I remind you of the non-abelian gauge transformation or skip that example? Um, should I do it? 
Do it, yeah. The thumb up means skip or do it? Do it. Do it. Do it. All right. Okay. Why don't I go over here? It's so tricky to say. This is what Yang and Mills um, invented. The basic idea is you have a field, this is a matter field, and you want to say that psi prime of x is this. Now, the, the striking thing here is that the transformation here is unitary, but it depends upon the space-time point. And so that's um, quite remarkable. It happens, though, in the case of electromagnetism, where psi prime of x is just e to the i beta of x psi of x. What Yang and Mills did was to go from this case where the group element is just a phase factor to the case where it's, say, an n by n unitary matrix. And the problem that uh, one has, both in this case and in that case, is, is not how do you keep things like psi dagger of x, psi of x invariant, because this is pretty easy. This is just psi dagger of x, u dagger of x, u of x, psi of x, and this is automatically invariant. The problem is, how do you get things like di psi, di psi dagger? How do you get these to be invariant? Because the derivative would act on the u as well as on the field. So that was the task that, the problem that Yang and Mills had to overcome. And what they did was they generalized the covariant derivative of electrodynamics. Uh, to um, something involving a matrix. So in other words, they introduced something called di, which is di plus ai, and what they wanted, so the question is, how do you make this invariant? And the idea is you go from di to a more complicated derivative and what you want is the di psi prime should be u di psi. And what does that mean? Well, that means that di plus ai prime u and I might as well put the psi in there. So, is equal to u di, which is di plus ai, psi. And now, if we just um, get rid of the psi, so to make things simpler, or if you want, I'll write it out completely. di psi, well, that's not right. We have di u, Psi plus u di psi plus ai prime u psi should equal u uh, di psi plus u ai psi. Okay. Now, these two terms cancel. And um, what we have left then, the psi is really, uh, let us say, if I can solve the equation without psi, promoting it to a matrix equation, um, uh, that will certainly satisfy this equation. So it would look much easier, much neater if I write as di psi plus ai prime u equals u ai. 
And so the solution then is that AI prime should equal U AI U inverse um, minus DI U U inverse. So this is the solution that uh, Yang and Mills invented. And notice that it is a generalization of what happens in the case of electrodynamics. Um, in the case of, let's see, was that allergies? That was allergies, I promise. Oh, it's you again. Yes, I'm sorry. I say, well. <laughs> I'm glad it's you and your allergies and not somebody else and not a serious viral infection. By the way, there, um, shucks, I should have mentioned this to you guys before, but UNM was giving flu shots for free. I don't know if they still are. I think it's passed. Huh? I think it's said it passed. They're passed? They were free last week. Yeah, I got mine free at Costco once. Uh, a couple months ago, probably worn off kind of. Um, but anyway, um, should all get flu shots. Um, and uh, I wonder, well, anyway, I don't know what the words are. But get flu shots when you can. The most effective form of medicine is vaccination. Because exercise is good too. All right, notice that this is a generalization of what happens in the case of electrodynamics. In the case of electrodynamics, this thing here is just a phase factor, and so this thing cancels. U, U, inverse, U in this case for electrodynamics, U is just this, so U, U inverse is just one, and so AI prime is equal to AI minus di of e to the i theta, e to the minus i theta. And now, if I just erase this, say, you see what you get is ai prime is ai minus i di of theta. And so this, you recognize you recognize this as the gauge transformation of electrodynamics. And when you combine it with this, you have the gauge transformation of quantum electrodynamics. What Yang and Mills did was they generalized that to non-abelian gauge theory. Non-abelian means that the group elements don't commute. Um, and uh, the, 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 the gauge field now is a matrix and it has to transform this way. To make the equation simple, the form simple, I wrote them this way. This is the way the mathematicians would write from derivative plus gauge field matrix. This gauge field matrix then is anti-hermitian. So the physicists write it as IA and then A is hermitian. But it's it, 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 it just really nice to get the eye out of the way so you have less things confusing. All right, are there any questions? So, to go from the, the delta i to the big di, I'm sorry, say that again. So the definition of di, right, you just transform. Big di. Yeah, this line. So to go from di to di, the arrow that's right before your box. Yes. To make that transformation. I mean, you can just do that in general. You can just say that that's good, or was there anything there? I don't know. I mean, you just redefine things. You said you want to make DI. Well, you're making a new theory, you see. Okay. What? All right, let's, let's maybe go over here. In other words, so, I mean, let's, let's, let's consider the case of a complex scalar field then your action density is something like this. Di, or maybe I should have said, all right, Di of phi, or let us call it psi, because I was calling it psi. And this would be D upper i psi dagger, 
and there would be a minus sign there. And then you have plus, I don't know, m squared, psi dagger psi, plus possibly other terms. Okay. This is a complex scale of field theory. Mass m, it's complex, so there are basically two kinds of the, the particle and an antiparticle in the, in the theory. Now, to go, to, to make it an electrodynamical theory, you'd replace this by minus, this thing would become di plus ai sine, and this would become minus di plus ai dagger. Psi dagger. Um, well, let's see. I, I'm, I'm, I should, let me let me write this correctly. It's. I want this to be minus di psi dagger. So that is minus. Um, EI plus AI psi, all of that dagger. Okay, so that's, that's what one has. Now, in the case of electrodynamics, the AI is just simply a, the gauge field, the electromagnetic field, apart from an I that I suppressed. Um, if, on the other hand, psi we start out with was a vector of complex fields, then this thing is a matrix. And in fact, in the context of our compact group theory, this AI would be, first of all, an I, A sub A by <coughs> TA. These would be the generators of some representation. These are the gauge fields. There's one gauge field for each generator in each dimension of space-time. And I pulled out, made the I explicit. So that's what you do. You change the theory from this to that. And um, remarkably enough, um, in the standard model of particle physics, that's actually um, what seems to work. Well, what in fact does work, at least um, to uh, Seven TeV. Yeah. So you said the combination of two things up there was the gauge from quantum electronics. But what was it again? I'm sorry. Say you that said, one more time. You said I think it was the AI prime and the psi prime together form the gauge for quantum electronics. All right, all right, all right. Let, let me give you the the, the jargon. This jargon confuses people. AI is the gauge field, the electromagnetic field. In the case of electrodynamics, it's just one, it's just one field for each dimension of space-time. The gauge transformation is just AI prime is AI and then minus I, a derivative of. And, and you see that there was an I hidden here because the ordinary electromagnetic field just changes by the derivative without an I. But this one's anti-emission. Um, in ordinary electro in quantum electrodynamics, the, the U1 transformation, why is it U1? Because this is a phase factor that's a unitary, one by one unitary matrix. So the gauge transformation is this, and the gauge field transforms this way. In, 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 um, in the, in the, Non-abelian gauge theory, psi is an n vector. This is an n by n unitary matrix. And the corresponding gauge field, which plays the role of a shock <coughs> absorber in the action density, is ai prime is u ai u inverse minus di u u inverse. And that's an n by n matrix. Now, there's the other term, this, this other jargon term, gauge. Well, what you can do, you see, is you can decide that you're going to work 
uh, in a particular gauge. That is to say, you're going to transform, say, the electromagnetic field to the Coulomb gauge so that the divergence of the three vector part of the electromagnetic field is zero. So that's working in a particular gauge. All right. All right, now, any other questions? Oh, wait, you didn't, somebody didn't get a, a lot of chocolates that I forgot to distribute. First of all, the, the, the mover of the camera, you, you asked at least one here. You asked one, right? I'm sorry about that. There are other, are you back there? There may be others. You just sneezed. Sorry. I'll take a chocolate though if you want to give some out. All right, all right. As cure for your allergies. Oh, thank you. All right, any other questions? Oh, I have a peanut. I have a question about the chocolate. Um, so, is this just like the photon field? This yes, yes. The, 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 let's put it this way this one, in fact, is what we're talking about. This is the electromagnetic field, this is the photon field. But in the case of a non abelian theory, when you're talking about this, where it's a matrix, then, um, for example, in the standard model, one of the groups is SU2. So that has three generators. So then there are three gauge fields. Now it turns out because of the Higgs mechanism, these acquire masses, and so they're the W plus, the W minus, and the C0. They're the analog, they're like the, pho they're gauge fields like the photon, and in fact, in the absence of the Higgs mechanism, there are four massless vector gauge fields. The w, two W's, W plus, W minus, Z, zero, and then the photon. Okay. That's, that's the standard model. And in the standard model, and this is a part that's um, more, much more mysterious, there are these, there were eight gluons that the quarks exchange, and those produce the strong interactions. Why do you say it's mysterious? These blue ones are massless. Excuse me? Why do you say it's mysterious? <laughs> it's mysterious um, because um, there's an embarrassment in theoretical physics, which I think is as bad as the congressional embarrassment of the national debt. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that the blue ones are confined and the quarks are confined. And there's no simple explanation of how that works. Oh. Um, what do you mean by combined? W? Well, they, they, all right, great question here. Uh, uh, let's see, actually, I have, no? Good, but thank you. Um, experimentally, you slam two protons together at the LHC, for example. Look, you know the protons are made of three quarks, and then sort of lots of, and the quarks are held together by gluons, so you have gluons and quarks in each proton. Spang, they come together, and what you'd think that what would come out would be six quarks. So you'd see six jets of, six, I shouldn't say jets, six quarks would come out, shattered, and um, you'd have in the final state, the process would be P plus P goes to six quarks. Two up, uh, four up quarks and two down quarks zooming away from each other at nearly the speed of light. Well, that's not what happens. What happens is proton-proton collide, and there are various, there are many, many different possible final states, but they're all of the form mesons. That is to say, quark-antiquark pairs, or uh, baryons, which are three quarks, um, and then other, other things that, that, are, that occur. But you never see a single quark, you never see two quarks, you only see quark, anti-quark, or three quarks, and you never see the, you never see the blue ones either. You instead just, uh, I mean, you'd expect, for example, if you have a, an electron, two electrons scattered at very high energies, you would get in the final state two electrons, 
and some photons flash of light. Um, the gluons are massless, but they don't come out at the speed of light. They instead come out only trapped in some meson or some baryon. That's very hard to understand. And um, there, there are some... You remember we, when we considered um, matrix elements of e to the minus beta h, I said that you could compute the mean value in the ground state of various fields as ratios of path integrals in Euclidean space. Well, Kreutz and Wilson and others developed that into uh, a, uh, applied Monte Carlo techniques to actually compute such ratios of path integrals after using Wilson's recipe for representing a gauge field very economically on a space-time lattice. And, um, they're, they see, uh, they're, they're able to understand confinement numerically, but what's missing is some sort of a theoretical understanding. And as I said, that's a huge embarrassment for theoretical physics, for the standard model, because apparently is, the standard model seems to be true. Um, Of course, the problem is that we can't, we don't know how to do path integrals except perturbatively. And that's a topic we have to get to shortly. Um, all right, well, we were talking, we, we talked last time about the rotation group. Let me just remind you quickly. Um, what we said is the group, first of all, O3 which leaves things uh, invariant, so you have um, x transpose dot y is x transpose r transpose r y, and so 1 is r transpose r. This can be, these matrices r, 3 by 3 matrices r that satisfy this rule form the group uh, O3. Notice what they leave invariant is the dot product of two arbitrary vectors. And so because it leaves something invariant, you naturally have the, the transformations form a group. The subgroup SO3 is also a group. And um, these are the, are the R's such that the determinant of R is equal to 1. These are the rotations. And so if we are talking about, if omega is small, so the norm of this thing is much less than 1, then we can say that r is the 3 by 3 identity plus omega. And then the rule 1 is equal to r transpose r tells you that 1 plus omega transpose 1 plus omega is 1. And this tells you that 0 is omega transpose plus omega. So omega must be an anti-symmetric matrix. And so we learned this. I'm, I'm repeating from last time. So omega transpose equals omega. Notice I ignored omega transpose omega because it's it's tiny squared. And uh, so the omegas uh, were minus 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 1 minus 1, this is omega 2, omega 3 was um, And think, uh, you mean to have a negative up on that top line? Yes. Omega t equals negative omega, top line. Minus. Omega transpose. Right, equals negative. Minus omega, thank you. You're, worried, 
you're entitled to two. You want any? I'm okay. I'm still working on this. Still working on this. Okay. So omega transposes minus omega, and um, these matrices, in fact, are given by the following rule: omega b, omega b, a c is epsilon a b c. This is the Levy Civita symbol, and um, so the in, in, in physics, what we do is we say, uh, if you want, this is TB, the AC matrix elements of TB. And what we say in physics is LA is um, H bar TA, or H bar omega A. And um, the representations then are to you that the um, commutation relation, the structure constants for this are TA, TB is I, Epsilon, ABC, TC. So these are the structure constants of the group. Just It's just the levy civita symbol. The rotations are obviously compact. And um, why are they compact? Because uh, this parameter space is um, a ball of, uh, I don't know, radius pi or 2 pi, if you want to make round drives it, ball in free space. The, the representation, the 3 by 3 matrices d theta are, um, you can think of it as e to the minus i theta dot t or theta dot omega. Where omega is the vector, a vector of three by three matrices, and um, quantum mechanically we write this as e to the minus i theta dot l over h bar. That cancels the h bar here and cancels this h bar. Um, But now, in, in we, were, uh, we have this group then, SO3, and there are many representations of it. We've been looking at the 3 by 3 representation, which is the defining representation. But in fact, there are um, all kinds of other representations of this. And um, in fact, uh, for every integer, you have a representation. And in fact, also the group SU2 has the same Lie algebra. And uh, so we actually have representations of the, uh, more of the rotation group, which are e to the minus i theta dot j over h bar and j. So I'm sort of. I'm kind of skipping a little bit, not much. Here we go. Um, the J's are um, J. J is a vector, so J1, J2, J3. These are 2J plus 1 by 2J plus 1 dimensional matrices. These are the matrices that represent the rotation group. And as in quantum mechanics, we define J1 plus IJ2, and I'll put a little J up here. This is equal to, um, in fact, these have, or let me say, plus or minus I. These are called the raising lowering uh, operators. And these things have matrix elements, delta S prime S, 
plus or minus one square root of j minus a plus s j plus or minus s plus one. And j3 um, j is a matrix that has matrix elements um, s delta s s prime and um, I, I'm sorry I, 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 I have been using a slightly different notation here I did not have an h bar here so these guys these j's don't have the extra h bar if I divide by h bar then you have a new h bar occurring here so in fact, if we do it quantum mechanically, it would be 1 over h bar here, there would be an h bar there, and an h bar there. Yeah. Kind of a random question that really related to the physics of it. But I was wondering, is it true in general that su n is isomorphic to so n plus 1? I don't think so. OK. Um, there, are, 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 uh, there are some magical relations like that, but um, there's none that that is that general. I see. Okay. The, the, the SUN group and the SON sequences are independent sequences. Okay. I was, I was kind of thinking about it in terms of if we were to think about like SU1 and SO2, for example, that would be a single complex number versus, you know, just thinking about like rotations on a unit circle. So from that, I was thinking yeah. you could maybe extrapolate yeah. up to higher dimensions. Right. Um, C1 is just 1, right? It's determinant 1. U1, well, SU1. SU1 is just the number 1. Yeah. yeah. Um, but U1 is the same thing as SO2. Rotations about uh, in two space. All right. OK, so that's the Lie algebra. And I noticed just this afternoon a typo, and um, I'm going to fix that uh, tonight. Um, if you put together, take the direct product of two representations of the rotation group, what you get is the direct sum, and this L goes from J minus K j plus k, and this is dl. So this is something you learn in quantum mechanics when you add angular momenta. All right, let's consider a field that transforms. Yeah, just quickly. The raising and lowering operator is the indice you like to say ss that. j1 plus, plus minus ij2. And but the, your, which element um, you've given a delta here with? <coughs> Excuse me. That's delta s prime s plus, plus one, or minus one. And so over here is s prime s. That's the s prime s element j plus minus. Right. This is the s prime. Right. And let me see if I yes. Okay. Um, now, under a unitary transformation, now that represents the rotation R, this field psi L of X. U inverse of R is going to transform as D L, L prime, and this is a um, this is the J representation, the spin J representation. Curiously, it's of R inverse, and then psi L prime of Rx. So this is the definition of how a field transforms under a rotation. 
U is a unitary a unitary uh, operator. This is a field, so it's a quantum operator depending on some space-time point. And uh, this has L values here that go from, let us say, minus J to J. Uh, I'm sorry, two J plus one values. From minus L goes from minus J to J, minus J to J. And you have, and this is the, this is the wall there. And so I was thinking of redoing the spin and statistics argument because it was perhaps rushed last time, or or was that? Also, there was a typo in it. So let me let me redo it because there was a typo. Uh, so your direct tensor product of representations. Um, so that's saying that if you have this is a matrix above that. Sorry. Oh, this direct product thing. Yeah. Yeah. This is for example. Let me give you an example. Okay. If you have um, if you have a spin one half and a spin one half, you can. What do you have? This is a half, and that's a half. The biggest you can have is one half plus one half, which is one. The smallest you can have is one half minus one half zero. So in fact, the the direct product of a spin one half representation times a spin one half representation gives you a vector represent a spin one representation and a spin zero representation. Okay. Um, I, I just messed up on your symbols. I didn't, I didn't quite get the symbols at first. Now I get them. Thank you. Okay, so let me come over here now. And the spin statistics argument is one that I I've adapted from a remark made by Wigner at a conference, and I just. Made it a little. So basically, if you start out with um, two, two points, U and V, space time points, and they're space like, that is to say, U minus V squared is positive, then you can always make a Lorentz transformation and go to a Lorentz frame in which in which U is equal to T X zero zero and V is equal to T minus X zero zero. So um, Equivalently, we, we can say we're just going to start out with considering those two points, and I'm just going to call this thing x and, um, or I'm going to call this tx and this thing t minus x. Okay. Now, um, suppose that a, a represents some quantum numbers that we're going to ignore, but m is the so-called magnetic quantum number. So we're going to have J3 on this is H bar M AM and uh, J3 on say BM is H bar M BM. Okay. Now, um, so in particular, I'm going to now talk about a, a, a rotation U is a rotation that's a right-handed rotation of pi about the z-axis. So it's R, uh, I guess I'd call it pi z hat. And this thing is E to the minus I pi J3 over H bar.
So U on AM is e to the minus i pi j3 over h bar on AM. This is e to the minus i pi m h bar over h bar is just this on AM. And similarly, u on BM is e to the minus i pi m BM. Okay, now, actually I could have done this thing more generally, but I think it's better to stay with what I've got and make it simpler. Now, U of R on Psi, let us say Psi L of Tx, U inverse, of r. This r is this pi z, rotation of pi about the z axis. Well, it's d l l prime of pi of r inverse, but r inverse and r are essentially the same. Anyway, psi l prime of um, t minus x because we rotated the field from x to rx. Okay, and so that takes Tx to T minus X. And um, what is this thing? Well, it is, once again, it is going to be E to the minus I pi J3 over H bar, this thing, so to speak, L, L prime, psi L prime of T minus X. Actually, it's R inverse, so it's actually a plus. And so, um, I wonder if I have, yeah, I had that right. Really well. Now, J3, though, is diagonal, and so this is just E to the I pi L, psi L of T minus X. So now um, I'm going to take this matrix element BM psi L of Tx psi L of T minus X AM and I'm going to insert U inverse U So I run out of space here, but you see this is all one equation. So BM Psi L T X Psi L T minus X A M. And then I've just taken that same thing and repeated it, but I've stuck the identity in the form U inverse U here, here, and here. So we've got three of them. But now U on A M is going to be Um, e to the i this is going to be e to the i m pi here so this is going to be psi l of t minus x u inverse a m times e to the, let me just get the sign right, u, u is a minus, so it's e to the minus i pi m. And then we have a, uh, a u and a u inverse psi l tx u. 
And this on that is bm, but now this is going to be e to the i pi m. So these two things cancel. And what this gives you, so let me write the, the cancellation. So we have u psi l of t and x, u inverse u psi l t minus x, u inverse a m. All right, now I'm going to have to go over to this, to the, to this board here. Psi L T minus X, Psi L T 
2x a m equals zero. So that's what the anti-commutator is. It's the product in one order plus the product in the other order. And so you get that vanishing. On the other hand, you get uh, the, the matrix element of the commutator vanishing, the equal sign the commutator. And it and and um, well, this is the this is the basis, or this this is an illustration of. In this case, Fermi-Dirac statistics, and in this case, Bose-Einstein statistics. And let me just mention for you then how it is that we quantize these um, these fields. The way one quantizes the there's the, 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 the commutator or the anti-commutator that does not vanish, but then there's the one that does vanish. And the one that does vanish is like this. It's always psi L of Tx, psi L prime of Ty. And in fact, I could have had an L prime here. Then we would have had 2 pi i L plus L. We would have had pi i L plus L prime. And L plus L prime would have been an integer. In fact, it, uh, the sum of two integers, <coughs> let's see, would, I, would that have gotten, uh, maybe I'm better sticking with L equals L prime. L equals L prime. In any event, the com this commutator vanishes if, it's, if, if L is an integer, or if J is an integer. J and L are integer, and J, L, 2n plus 1 over 2, then what you have is psi L of T and X, psi L prime of T and Y, anti-commutator vanishing. So you have the anti-commutator vanishing, equal time anti-commutator vanishing, or equal time commutator vanishing. These are the canonical commutation relations that one imposes in the case of fermions and bosons. And so you see, you get out of a relation that's like that from just the properties of the rotation group. All right, is there a question? I have, I have, a couple of stories, I guess. Um, all right, one story is um, a story that Lyndon Johnson used to tell. Um, he was from Texas and he grew up during the Depression. And uh, the story is of a school teacher, I think a high school teacher. And um, he was applying for a job and he was before some commission that had just a few jobs, teaching jobs to give out. And so the members of the commission asked the candidate, are you going to teach that the world is flat or that the world is round? And the, the teacher was so desperate for, for a job that he said, I can teach it either way. Another Lyndon Johnson story is that Johnson, um, one, he was called by somebody um, a tornado in pants, in that he was always active. He was, he was extremely energetic, very hard working. He was basically always on the phone and talking with people, calling people to, calling members of Congress and persuading them to vote for something that he wanted passed. And um, in fact, there's a man, Robert Caro, who's written four books about. Lyndon Johnson. Um, I read number three, bought number four. Um, the trouble with Caro is that his sentences are almost as long as his books, and his books are a thousand pages. Um, but they're very well written. Anyway, uh, well, I've gone off on a tangent, I've forgotten what I was talking about. Um, 
in any event, Lyndon was so, he had telephones all over the White House, and I think there were 76 telephone lines in the White House, or in his part of the White House. Um, others where the, all his aides were, worked, I mean, and, and he would take the telephone into the toilet, and these were days before the cell phone, so, this, he, in fact, he just had a telephone in the toilet, it wasn't that he had a carry to him. And um, he was once sitting there on the toilet, and he called some, called some aide on the phone to come up because he wanted to talk with them, and the aide didn't want to go into the, into the toilet while Lyndon was on the pot. And so he stood out there and sort of sheepishly talked to him in the corner. And then the following week, he was again called up into the White House bedroom, and Lyndon was there on the toilet again um, in the bathroom. And this time, he was again shy, but as he looked in, he saw that Dean Rusk, who was the Secretary of State, and um, what was the other guy's name, Robert McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense, were both sitting on the floor with their backs <laughs> on the wall in the bathroom, talking with Lyndon Johnson, who was on the floor. And so he said, well, if the two of them can go in the market to say he went in and sat down and they conferred with Linda. And what they were doing, they had a map of Vietnam on the wall. And um, uh, what the people who told this story, I heard it over C-SPAN this past weekend, um, what they were saying was that, the, that Lyndon was that Lyndon never liked the Vietnam War. He was always against it, but for some reason, which I don't understand, he felt as though he couldn't do anything about it until 68, when he um, decided that, he, that the time was right to try to negotiate an end to the Vietnam War. So instead of running for re-election, he devoted himself entirely to ending the war. But at that time, some members of Nixon, he was, his, his vice president, Hubert Humphrey then, was running for president in 68. The Republican candidate, which Richard Nixon, some group on Richard Nixon's team um, sent envoys over to North Vietnam or somehow communicated with the people in North Vietnam and said, or South Vietnam, I think it must have been South Vietnam, and said, look, don't you guys uh, agree to anything? You'll get a better deal if Nixon's elected. And uh, so the South Vietnamese refused to negotiate with the North Vietnamese. The war was not ended in 68, and it went on for another essentially four years. Um, anyway, um, that shows you how bad politics can be. So those are the stories. Um, any questions? My field isn't history, so you mustn't ask deep questions. All right, let me um, go to something. We can do something, namely the Jacoby identity. This is rather a magical and very simple identity. And it's certainly worth, well worth um, your seeing. So let me just show you what's going on here. Let's first of all take the commutator of A with BC. And so obviously this is ABC minus BCA. But now, as is often true in mathematics, if you take one step backwards and rewrite this in a more complicated way, as ABC minus BAC plus BAC minus BCA. So I've just stuck in minus back plus back in the middle. You can now rewrite this as AB commutator C plus B commutator AC. 
Now, if you interchange B and C, what you get is ACB is ACB plus C is AB. So I've just interchanged B and C. And now, if we subtract the second from the first, what we get is A. You see, if you subtract the second from the first, you're getting A B, the commutator of A with the commutator of B with C, equal. And now, uh, what do we have? We're subtracting this from that, and that gives you the commutator of AB with C plus the uh, commutator of B with um, AC. That's what you get. And that's called the Jacobi identity or the Jacobi identity. A nicer way of writing it is the cyclic way of writing it, namely A, B, C plus B, C, A plus C, A, B equals zero. So this is, this is very, very general. I'm thinking here of A, B, and C as being n by n matrices. But this works almost no matter what A and B and C are. And so, as I said, this is called the uh, Jacobi identity. There's another one that involves the anti-commutator. And, um, well, I might as well write it down because we only have a little bit of time. So the anti-commutator of the commutator of A would be with C plus the anti-commutator of the commutator of A with C, B, plus now the commutator of the anti-commutator of B with C with A is zero. And probably other ways of writing that but look nicer. Um, the next thing to do is um, something called the adjoint representation. And I will just write down the beginning of this thing, and then we'll, we'll finish it uh, next time. Namely, if you take the generators, you see the TA with TB, TC, plus TB with TC, TA plus TC with TA, TB equals zero. So the this Jacobi identity can be applied to the generators of the Lie algebra. And this is the, and we can apply, this works whether these, this is the, these are the generators of a compact group or a non-compact group. Yeah. Uh, on the, the line above that, do you mean the, your third identity? You meant to switch the brackets with the uh, anti-commutator brackets? You know, I, it, it would be so much nicer, but I think that this is correct. Okay. Um, however, if it's, if it's wrong, uh, send me a text message or an email or something. All right. Um, I'll try to put some homework problems on the web page. Um, but uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm I will send you an email. I'll send the class that email if I put some problems on the web page. The problem is that um, I have to do the 2011 taxes. All right. So why don't you?